we'll go ahead and get kicked kicked off. Uh, so um, yeah, let's just go around the room and check in and how are things going? Businesses that you guys got? Or? Board mm -hmm. room, it's all along. Yeah, I know I, every time I drive by, I told you this, you, the pack, the night that you have a huge parking lot. But, <laughs> yeah, but yeah. yeah. There's there's not, two people <laughs> show up, the parking lot's full. <laughs> but I know you told me you were having some different types of uh, Barbecue or something. Well, we did we did some barbecue. Now I'm re revamping the food menu, getting enough food in there. So there's a daily food special every day. And oh really? Five dollar pints. There's always something in the crock pot. There's always two dollar hot dogs and big Nathan hot dogs. Nice. Okay. Just That's different good. stuff. Just easy, easy stuff. Cool. That's the uh, gym. Yeah, I'm just doing great. Um, as COVID was and the turmoil and the stress and everything, it forced us to make some changes and uh, adjustments. And you know, just looking at probably 20% profit margin this year, where nice. the Good. industry, the norms, four to 8%. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, few, few growing issues with the amount of teenagers coming in from the high school. That is exploded, but. And they spend the money there. We're doing four to five hundred dollars a day in food and beverage. And, uh, Be a kid and disposable income. Yeah. <laughs> Where well, do they get from? I, I think for a lot of parents, the parents pick them up about five o'clock or whatever. And so they're there right after school for a couple of hours. And the parents just give them five, ten bucks a day. <laughs> they're in there they're they're the same one day every day. But uh, as much as they force play around and stuff, they're working out. Girls followed. I mean, it was funny. <laughs> Summer hits. That's where the boys were. They're working out, right? Pretty soon, the girls started saying, "Hey, there's a lot of boys at the gym," <laughs> and they'd come and they would sit on the machine and be on their phone, and there'd be like five pound plates on there. It'd be the funniest thing. You'd see them with the boys over there, and then on their phone, and they'd be there for a half hour. But eventually, those same girls. We got 35 pound plates on there. They're working out. There's an app on the media start using it. So, you know, it just it, it gets addictive that way. Sure. Um, and, you know, it's like 40 or 60 of them right after school come in or that's half the time, you know, we're having to break up the swarms and, you know, there's some potty mouths we're dealing with. So, when we first opened, we had the same issue. They were force playing and they're from the gym, they were dragging their friends, trying to throw them in the pool and everything else. And we had a, a guy that worked for us that was a uh, substitute PE teacher. And we had him literally doing security control in place. And we had to lay down the law and say, you're done for a month, happen again. You're done for six months. And they'd come back and they'd be begging to come in. What do I have to do? I go, wait your time. <laughs> you know, it's a, you know, doing that two or three, and, and you know, it's the uh, same with COVID. We have to scale down on payroll and you know, cut some of the fat, and boy, it hates everybody else up. I think part of business is almost like you know, once a year, I gotta fire someone, <laughs> everyone else in line. <laughs> now you don't want to fire anyone because you can't hire someone to replace them. Yeah. Maybe in your business, you can't, I can't, but <laughs> yeah. That's, Definitely been an uh, interesting few years and the adjustments. It just, it, you know, and it reflects on what we're looking at is this economic future plan. And it's, yeah, you have to be able to pivot. That's one of the things, uh, especially our business. I mean, it flip flops and changes. You got to be able to adjust the change and go for it. I mean, we totally changed to. Always multiple memberships, so we just scale it down and uh, more cost effective for families. And for that aspect, is exploded. Yeah. And that's kind of what the, the need was, would be because we're kind of a community center as mm -hmm. much as just a gym. So, making those adjustments uh, definitely help. So, I, you know, in learning that, it's like what's being discussed here. How do you put that flexibility into it? Because guaranteed, every three to five years, things change. Mm -hmm. And people at Builder Club, they specialized in hotels. And they said, 
it's typical every uh, four to five years. Everything gets remodeled, all the rooms, and mm -hmm. change it. And then go ahead and adjust, you know, make the allowances for that. Well, we've had an abnormal change over the last five years, too. Well, they say every five years, the knowledge of humans doubles. Hmm. So what's going to happen in the next five years? You know, does it go crazier? Or, uh, I keep hoping we're are we going to be on Mars? Are we going to be on Mars? Yeah. Colonizing. Well, it, it sounds good that, you know, you're getting that younger crowd, that next generation in there and well, figuring out, you know, working out and well, taking we, we, get, we get complaints that, you know, all these teenagers that are you know, you get it on the social media. You want to, you know, yeah, patrol in the streets or in your basement with their friends smoking pot and everything else. So, in positive environment, I'll take all day long. We'll just sure. I'll adjust. Yeah, it was like a lot worse places they could be. When I was growing up, uh, the the golf course over here in Boring, you know, uh, had a great program for kids to go through. Very inexpensive, got them in there. And even back then, I realized you're just getting them hooked. Like, yeah. you know, like get out there golfing, teach them how to do it correctly, teach them how to do it. And it's a lifelong sport. So, kind of like in the gym, you know, it's a lifelong health benefits and these things that they right. enjoy. Yeah. If you miss out on that, you know, but it's also building in your client base for the future, too. Right. All that exposure, I think. The, they've done a lot away with PE classes and mm -hmm. presence council and physical fitness and these different things. Um, and sixty percent overweight obesity in this country. It's a health pandemic that um, got worse with COVID, and it, it just boggles my mind why we had these shutdowns and closed gyms. It was the opposite should have been true. Is the, the people most volatile to were those that were overweight or over a certain age and had if you had diabetes and were 60 and overweight, yeah, you need to be scared with you know any kind of disorder. Uh, yeah, I had I think a couple months ago I had COVID, it was a nothing burger. I was tired for two days and then worst part of the sore throat for, for about three days. Yeah, I, I ended up having COVID <clears throat> this last year, um, right around Hood Coast. Oh, so I were you doing the coast? Coast? I did. Oh, you did it anyway. Oh yeah, yeah. Wow. And uh, so I ran like a six thirty down. I had the first leg, you know, downhill, that and through it. And got back, got down with it. And my wife's like, take the test, you know. And sure enough, I did. But I felt like I only had half a lung left. <laughs> but even with all the other stuff, um, you know, people at work are like, oh, it's all that running you do, because you know, I I ran every day for now over six years, and just yeah. constantly. One should be in pretty good shape. Yeah. And at one point, I thought I had COVID kind of right at the beginning before COVID was kind of in the US because, you know, I never get out of breath. Never. Like I, I ran the 50Ks. I mean, so, you know, you can just, once you're in that cycle, you can just, I never, I never would train. I mean, I'm out of shape a little bit more now, but shape because I'm always training, right? So I could go out and do a 50K. I'd you sweat, but I wouldn't get out of breath. You know your sweet spot, right? You, there, you got that sweet spot. That you, I can just almost like run forever. Right. You know? Yeah. Push it if up my legs. 10%, <laughs> you start, you know, if you start Cramp to bring up. out a little bit. But, 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 never, but, it keeps, but, but it also keeps you trim. Your body fat down, yeah. less stress to the organs. And that's that's the key part is that. But I remember just, it was like one day, it's like, I couldn't even run the mile. I mean, I finished my, you know, the run, but I was like, I'm out of breath. We're in the world. You know, it was a few of my other running friends. Yeah, I said a few of my other running friends. But yeah, I ran hood to coast. And it was like that next day. And like, oh, that week. And yeah, I had a little bit of a, I was a little tired and, and uh, sore throat for a little bit. But for some people, who I know very out of, you know, they, anyway, you awesome. could sneeze on the other side of Sandy and they caught it. Yeah. Everyone's different. But I, I spent all of September with it. Wow. I was down twice. Yeah. I got bad lungs. So I, you know, but I work out and ride my bike and stuff. So it kind of right. I tell everybody I was, I was born dead and premature. I got better. <laughs> I just, yeah. I just uh, recovered from about two weeks ago, but um, I have an autoimmune disease that put my back slowly, which is the best stuff ever. Highly recommend if yeah. you get, if you get it and you can get it back twice. 
Yeah. Um, I was, well, yeah, I was just telling Jeremy earlier that I, I got it. I, I, boy, that the first day I woke up with it, that was bad. Um, I woke up in a pool and I sweat. I yeah. took me half a day sitting right by the fire before I could eat the warm enough food. And uh, man, that, that, that antiviral stuff, I took those for four days. I was testing everything and it felt great. Yeah. But yeah, it was for sure. I was, I was, I was good two days in. She had me on that prednisone. It's like, I like that a million bucks. It's like, yeah, oh, this is going to last. <laughs> and then I was, got done with my having the quarantine and went back to work to start busting butt again. And a week later, yeah. back down I went. She put me back on the antivirals and said, when you go back to work, you take it a little bit easier. Yeah. You are in your 60s now. <laughs> well, why don't we go ahead and get going? Um, we have Elliot on there. And you know, we'll just jump into his presentation and we'll wrap back up around afterwards. Sure. Mr. Weiss, you've gone before. I'm, uh, I'm under the impression that you're trying to wrap up a little bit early. Yeah, we'd like to wrap up a little bit early. Uh, uh, we are, I was going to, at the end here, suggest that anyone that would like to go down to Boring Brewery there and, and just hang out as a more of a social time, um, they don't have to by any means, but we'll kind of wrap early so we get the agenda light. So kind of the end of the year, the holidays, Christmas time. Um, I also, I'm, my last economic development meeting. So yeah, this is Jer Jeremy's last economic development meeting as our chair, and also uh, December nineteenth is his last um, city council. He's stepping down. From city council. I'm not stepping down. I'm not running again. Not running again. Yes, he's not stepping down. That's right. I've done it for sixteen years. I was on planning for two, saving it for I don't know nineteen uh, years, um, and my kids are. I'm a freshman in high school, an eighth grader and a sixth grader. So I will miss out on the legs if I don't. And my job's changed quite drastically to where I work all the time. Um, but literally. So I'm I'm uh, I don't want to miss out on their their lives and my family Like last night, we gotta go to the uh, the banquet for my son in cross country as a freshman in, in letter. Right. So that was pretty pretty neat. That's so pretty cool. A shy kid that he was able to perform well and do that, and that so it's kind of fun to go enjoy that so it's a different stage of my life but i'm not leaving soldier by any means and i'm sure i'll volunteer in other ways so i may even be back here <laughs> so um so yeah so a little bit uh, that's why we're going to cut a little short well, I only brought it up because I, I do not want to get in the way of that. That's the last thing I would want to do. So um, I do have some slides. Unfortunately for you all, they're not very visual. It's all text. But I intend for this to be discussion to the extent that we can make it that. I just would like to hear your feedback. We've kind of reached another milestone in the project. So I will start sharing my screen, and then uh, we can discuss whatever sort of piques your interest. Might want to if you turn around and there's a bigger screen that's all of you up there. So. Okay. We've got them on both screens now, so oh. whichever you fancy. Are you able to see the screen? Not um, yet. It says uh, you have started screen sharing. Did that do anything? Nope. Nope. Hmm. Okay, let me try something else here. My Zoom has been acting up recently. This is not the first time this has happened, but I haven't been able to find a solution yet. So let me see if I can get this to work. Do you have a copy of the slides? Uh, that's a good question. You could just present them and then go through. Yeah. Um, hey, Elliot, I, you know, if you email me, I, I don't know if the version of your slides that you sent me earlier is uh, if you made any changes to that, but um, if you email me your slide deck, I could probably share it from here. They've not changed substantially. A couple minor edits, but it, I would be just fine using the version that I sent you earlier today, David. Okay. Um, hold on one minute. 
Now, the other wrinkle to this is that the last time this happened, when I clicked stop screen sharing, my Zoom just froze and I had to close out and come back in. So if I disappear momentarily, I will rejoin you, I promise. We can get all that we need. What? Welcome to the last week. <laughs> yeah, all right. Yeah. So I guess we're having uh, issues on this. Yeah, on this end too. Thank you. How the hell did that happen? All right. All right. I think we're back on track with Ellen. Let's see here. So I will download that. You need to kick Elliot and have him rejoin back in. Probably. Yeah, it looks like he's kind of stuck in limbo here trying to present. Yeah, what yeah. I think you may have to rejoin. Yeah, it looks like I had to duck off momentarily there, but I'm back. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so this is just an issue I'm going to have to take up with Zoom, I think. <clears throat> Um, Perfect. Thanks, David. Yeah, sure. I put a loose agenda on here, but notice I did not indicate an end time. That was because of your intent to wrap up a little bit early. I'm going to facilitate that to whatever extent I can, but I wanted to give an update on project status. And then the two new pieces of content that we've developed since we met with you at the end of September are the SWOT analysis and the vision and goals. I would consider both of those to be draft in the sense that they have been reviewed by David and other city staff, but they've not had your review and there's certainly still time to edit them. So we're looking for your feedback on the SWOT analysis and maybe more significantly the vision and the goals. As a reminder, and I suppose we can go to the next slide, David, where we're at, the vision and goals are the sort of top level of the hierarchy in what will become your economic development strategy. After we've got those in place, we start to develop strategies and actions that nest underneath the goals. So we get increasingly detailed or increasingly specific. And so today we're, we're going to be at a fairly high level, but we're taking not just what we've learned from the data analysis, but also what we learned when we were on the ground, what we heard from stakeholders, what we heard from the public at whippersnappers. And we've tried to distill that into that first level of the hierarchy, the vision and the goals. We are still on pace for completion in Q1 of 2023, which is what we've been saying since June or July, I think. And the actual strategies themselves are underway right now. I was just emailing with David earlier today, and I think we may have a draft of those in place within the next couple of weeks here. I would anticipate we'll do a few rounds of review internally with city staff before bringing that to you as an advisory board. Understandably, Jeremy will miss you in January but we will come back for one more board meeting with that strategy in hand before we move into sort of producing the final document. I'll just pause quickly in case any of you have questions about where we're at in the process. Good. All right. So this is what we've heard, what we've learned. Some of these will not be surprising to you. Maybe some will represent some new thinking, but strengths for Sandy, are a vibrant downtown and a distinct brand. The design of the buildings in the Sandy style sort of contribute to that. It's a retail hub for all of East Clackamas County, and you have a rather large trade area that you pull from to support your local retailers. You are the only 
location in this part of the county that offers some of the, the big box offerings that you do have. And at the same time, you're close to a strong regional economy. You're not so far removed from the rest of the metro area that you can't trade on that in some way or access that labor pool. You also have world-class infrastructure by virtue of being at the edge of the metro area, such as the airport. Um, so those are strengths as well. Innovative infrastructure investments that distinguish Sandy from other communities, such as Sandy Net and your recycled water. Your location, of course, on the road up to Mount Hood is an obvious strength. And you have other recreational assets above and beyond just those on the mountain, including local ones like your parks, um, Sandy River Park, Mining Park, and then those just outside of town, like the mountain bike trail system at Sandy Ridge. Big sort of prime time events like the Sandy Mountain Festival that bring tens of thousands of people to town. Strong base in certain sort of industrial niche activities, and we'll talk more about that, but that's one thing that was elevated through the economic opportunities analysis being done currently by one of your other consultants. Proximity to the Fruit Loop and local produce growing, um, and a relatively young workforce with relatively high labor force participation compared to other communities. All of those things emerged as strengths. In terms of weaknesses, while you do have good access to infrastructure and you are on a major highway, you are, of course, not on an interstate highway, so certain types of industrial uses are especially light industrial uses and uses like warehousing, transportation, wholesaling, etc. cetera, um, typically prefer that interstate access, so that will be a constraint in certain cases or depending on certain business types. There are also land development constraints, so you've got some steep slopes, of course, you've got streams running through town, easements that you've got to deal with, things like that. And the highway itself is sort of a double-edged sword in the sense that it can also introduce issues of traffic congestion. It makes walkability in the downtown a little bit more challenging. So that's something to consider. Uh, job training opportunities. This is primarily referring to the fact that, you know, there's no local post-secondary institution. You have to go outside of town for that. Um, and then in the data, we see a few things here that there are relatively low median wages in Sandy as compared to other cities in Clackamas County, not all cities, but several others. Um, one third of the population is still cost burdened or severely cost burdened. And by that we are referring to their housing costs. So about 33% of Sandy residents pay more than 30% of gross income on housing costs, uh, which just basically means that housing can be a challenge for, for certain Sandy residents or that housing affordability is a potential constraint on economic growth. And unemployment still exceeds pre-pandemic levels. So while there's been an obvious rebound in the sense that businesses are open. I mean, we were all just, you all were just talking about that in the intro. Um, unemployment hasn't fully rebounded just yet. Opportunities, um, certainly scaling up the small and locally owned businesses that you have, not just in your downtown core, but primarily in your downtown core. Those are um, assets that you have that can be grown, that the city can support to a greater extent. There are also infill opportunities in downtown. And, you know, we've had long conversations as a project team about, you know, well, this parcel looks like it's developable, but actually the landowner's unwilling to sell or there are other constraints. We get all that, but we're also trying to take a longer view of things and think strategically about where you're going in five, 10 years, whenever it may be. And so there is land downtown that at some point could be put to a higher and better use than what it currently is. There are developable sites as well in newly planned areas. So we sort of joked last time about this idea of West Sandy, but it is the case that there's a West Sandy concept plan being developed. And there are three draft concepts, as I understand it, that have been advanced for critique. And so that land can be put to use in the sense of being an economic anchor, that it can be aligned with the economic development strategy and the economic opportunities analysis so that you're really getting the best possible value out of that land when it does develop. Um, new connections between existing local and regional recreational assets are just elevating those assets so that it's not just, yeah, people use them and maybe they pass through Sandy, but people use them and they generate more economic activity for Sandy, I think is an opportunity. There's limited nearby lodging and hospitality 
options. So it seems like with all the recreational assets, but then also other assets that I've just mentioned on the strengths page, there could be an opportunity to do some more of that and to compete in that space or offer something different in that space than what's being offered um, you know, further up the mountain or I suppose back in Gresham. Um, there are other companies throughout the metro that may have some synergies with some of the industries that you already have strong workforce characteristics in and strong local businesses in. So I mentioned metals manufacturing on the strength slide because you do have an existing cluster. It's not huge in terms of raw employment numbers, but you have some strong businesses in that space. And then we look to the broader region and there are some very big businesses in that space that compete nationally or, or internationally. And so finding those synergies is an opportunity. Uh, we mentioned Precision cast parts and Leatherman as two here on this slide. Uh, those may not be the only ones or the best, but they they are out there. Um, there are some synergies, I think, too, with food or food processing and storage. We mentioned the Fruit Loop, um, but also um, there's some specialty food and beverage um, businesses locally. There's an opportunity for food processing, storage, and distribution. Um, so that's something to consider. And then growth of your home-based workforce. We've spoken in the past about the number of people who commute to and from uh, downtown Portland or other centers within the metro that are more office-focused. And a lot of those people still haven't returned, at least full-time, to in-office settings. And so there may be an opportunity to keep some of that economic activity home in Sandy while they are home in Sandy, as long as you can continue to facilitate their productive work. And finally, threats, and then I'll pause and we can discuss a bit. Um, growth itself can be a threat. You are projected to grow quite rapidly to nearly double in population over the next 20 years, if I recall correctly. And you've got to make sure that that doesn't either outpace the city's ability to provide infrastructure and services, or it doesn't otherwise degrade the character that people value about Sandy, the high quality of life that makes people choose Sandy again and again. So that's a threat potentially, um, you've got to manage growth well. Um, adjusted expectations for outdoor recreation based on climate trends, for lack of a better term. We're seeing increasing um, prevalence of severe weather events. We're seeing decreased snowfall. And so if we're thinking about the long-term and what the future of these recreation industries will be, we might need to think creatively about what assets are going to be resilient when we are seeing more wildfires or more rain in January and February at five and 6,000 feet. So that's another thing to consider. Challenge to recruiting skilled healthcare and social assistance workers, particularly pediatricians. That's something we're largely hearing from people rather than something we're seeing in the data. But if we're talking about how we maintain Sandy's quality of life and make sure that Sandy can offer what it is that residents or potential residents or potential workers are looking for, then that's something we need to look out for. Same deal with childcare, really. It, it's, it's a critical service that people need um, in order to live in Sandy, in order to work in Sandy. And Sandy's not unique in that regard, but it is something that we've been hearing from people as we've been doing the engagement for this project. Um, the retail options, it seems like there's an opportunity. I mean, this is, I think this is almost more of an opportunity than a threat, but it lands on this slide, so, so be it. I think, People are looking for experiential retail and certainly something like Boring Brewing and the food carts offer an experience that is compelling, that is unique, that bring people into downtown. And we just need to make sure that to the extent that we're focusing on retail uses and focusing on downtown, we're elevating the types of uses that are going to encourage people to stay in Sandy, if not overnight, then at least for long enough to spend some money to support some local businesses. Rising housing costs sort of alluded to that on the weaknesses slide with the percent of residents that are cost burdened. But if housing prices continue to outpace wage growth, that's certainly a threat to Sandy's economy. And sort of related to that is the attainability of home ownership. It, it, it used to be in Sandy far more attainable than it currently is just when looking at median home sales price versus wages, one has outpaced the other. And again, that's something that's not unique to Sandy. That's a, a challenge in many cities and across the metro, but it's something that Sandy nonetheless needs to deal with in order to really 
optimize um, its economic growth. So anything there that you'd take issue with, that we missed, that you think ought to be elevated for even more serious consideration? I, I'd like to pause here and just hear your thoughts. I mean, just out of curiosity, what what would be a strategy to combat rising housing costs and, and you know home ownership should be becoming unattainable? I mean, you'd have to have a long term strategy for that, I would imagine. But I think a lot of cities or uh, and uh, counties in Oregon are looking at this right now. They go, oh, we don't know what to do, <laughs> and I'm, I think we're probably in that basket also. Yeah, and it's fortuitous, David, that you've got your comp plan update going on right now, too, because your housing element is going to tackle that question directly. Um, I think from an economic development strategy standpoint, we don't want to focus on housing too much. And it's always a sort of calibration question of how much is too much. Um, I think what we want to do is we want to put language into the economic development strategy that reinforces and supports the strategies that your comp plan folks are going to be advancing so that the two documents are talking to each other. And if Sandy wishes for it to go beyond that, that's certainly a conversation we can have because there are certain cities that want to elevate it even further in their economic development strategy. But that's sort of my typical reaction to that question. I will say there are a lot of things that you can do, um, different things with your development regulations, your zoning incentives that can be put in place, for the development of new housing, for the development of workforce housing, things like that. Um, the city can become an active partner in the development of housing, which is a little bit more, I guess, radical, and it may not be the right answer for Sandy, but there are cities that are looking at that. And then again, just to bring it back to what an economic development strategy does, it could be that what we focus on in this document is not you know, what do you do with your zoning to get more housing that is affordable to local workers? It's how do you attract industries that pay higher wage jobs that can afford the housing that we anticipate being available in Sandy? And so we come at it from multiple angles, and it could just be the case that the best angle for this document to approach is the jobs, and the best angle for the comp plan to approach is the development regulations, the zoning, et cetera. So I think all that's on the table. And I'm just I'm looking at your, the threats slide here too because that's just what's in front of me. Um, yeah, the childcare shortage is is uh, we've I think you know Jeremy's probably seen a lot of this too. We talked a lot about this over the last year two years, and um, I think the city's done a, a fair job in responding that to that a little bit by adding um, you know daycares to the tenant improvement uh, grant program, even though that's um, on a hiatus at the moment. It won't be forever. Um, and we've used we've already um, used that grant program to add a, a, or to re-add uh, a daycare that had uh, left due to a bad uh, property situation. So, um, you know, I think we've done what we can there. And this is another one of those issues. This is another one of those items that is just you know we can do a little bit. There's only I think so much you can do, being considering it's a, a statewide problem. Um, that's going to require a solution that's bigger than sand. But I think, yeah, I, I guess my point is, I think we're doing what we can do as a community. Um, we're taking the action that we can right now, and it is having a little bit of that. It is sort of a shame. Maybe I, it's like we call it a SWOT analysis. So we go in that order, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats, but then we pause on the threat slide, which is no fun, right? We should, should have paused on the, the strengths slide. Because I do think that, what we found is much more on the strength slide, much more on the opportunities slide, less on the weaknesses and the threats. But I suppose it's important to be mindful of all of them and to be realistic about where Sandy's position is relative to the region in terms of economic opportunity. Look at the, you know, housing strengths. Strengths, you've got, I mean, you're 20, 30 minutes you're skiing. You've got multiple rivers and lakes that you have access to. So the quality of life here versus, you know, you look at Hillsboro, well, that just goes way that out there, you know, uh, an hour to the coast, maybe. Uh, but you have, with that environment, I mean, if, if I was, you know, had the land, someone like Nike would probably say, hey, quality of life here, mm -hmm. cheaper land, especially if you get rezoned to farmland or something like that. 
Columbia Sportswear or, or any of those. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that because you put as a threat for uh, the recreation, you know, you've got, you've got skiing in the mountain. At some point in during the year, you're going to have a couple of months that's available. The rivers and lakes aren't going to dry up. Um, and the hiking, yeah, you might have wildfires here, but you don't elsewhere. Right. And you know, the easy accessibility to other recreational areas like Redmond Bend, uh, I think that bodes well with all that. So I think people, you know, housing is a little bit higher. They would come here. There's opportunity. I mean, there's a lot of uh, land that can be rezoned. Uh, you know, but you know, has to go with it. I think that's what maybe like Sandy, Packness County has to be aware of some of that infrastructure to accommodate that. You know, let's just take one big player and this, this area that could blow up. And what happened in Hillsborough? Yeah, it's the one, and then you get all the small business coming in to feed off of it, and it just perpetuates itself. The, the highway coming through is yeah, a bit of an issue as well. Yeah, just looking at the opportunity slide, um, I think we've also done a pretty good job of managing our infill in downtown, and we're starting to see some development in that infill now, which is great. It's what I've wanted to see since the first day I've gotten here. It's really Delightful to see some of these lots being filled. Like the the Dutch rooms was just fantastic. I mean, we turned a, a problem lot into a, a, a really good money business. Um, so it's it's nice to see some of these infill opportunities um, get taken up by local businesses, and um, there will be more in the near future. And um, I hope to see that continue. Uh, the only thing that concerns me about that is um, at some point we'll run out of infill opportunities, which. Um, at least in the downtown, which is what I think what makes the Pleasant Street Master Plan um, so much more important for us to discuss later on. Monday. But what's done? And the metal, uh, in fact, uh, the metal uh, light manufacturing and all that, it's interesting to see that come up because um, Clackamas County has mentioned the same thing is that we, we uh, their Clackamas County as a, as a whole is really pushing that because. It's not just Sandy, it's in Canby and a few other cities in Clark County as well, have that same um, kind of subsection of their economy. And it's, it's interesting that just to see that come up here as well, because uh, Clark County kind of would very much like to see us expand our metals manufacturing businesses. Well, that's If you'd like, we can move on. Yeah, I can walk through the vision and the goals. And the goals really, um, they grow out of the SWOT analysis. So if there's nothing you're taking issue with in the SWOT analysis, move on to the goals that might, might um, we might have a richer conversation there because we can actually do some wordsmithing. It's, it's something more tangible to respond to. In any case, visioning wise, we wanted to draft a vision statement that was consistent with the vision that is being advanced in the comprehensive plan, but was specific to economic opportunities or Sandy's economy. And we came up with two versions and then got some feedback from city staff and, and came up with a revised single version. I was gonna present all three just so you could see how they evolved. So the first version was Sandy is a rich community at the crossroads of the Portland Metro and the wilderness of the Cascades, offering a unique balance between economic opportunity and old fashioned fun. From the strong local businesses in our traditional downtown to the high-tech telecommuters zooming at gig speeds, we recognize and elevate all that makes Sandy the most vibrant base camp for adventures in Oregon. The second one, Sandy is a bridge between the economic might of the Portland region and the outdoor gems of Mount Hood, offering businesses and residents a unique balance between professional opportunity and outstanding quality of place. We cherish the small businesses that propel our vibrant downtown and welcome visitors who wish to experience all that Sandy can offer while strategically investing in new high quality jobs for our talented residents. And then the synthesis of those two, Sandy is a vibrant community that leverages the economic might of the metropolitan area and the outdoor gems of Mount Hood, offering businesses and residents a unique balance between professional opportunity and outstanding quality of place. We cherish the small businesses that propel our dynamic downtown and welcome visitors who wish to experience all that Sandy has to offer while strategically investing in new high quality jobs for our talented residents. So clearly that one's closer to 
the second version that I had read. Um, I think pretty much all city staff who reviewed it, and David, you can comment on this a bit, preferred the second version. And then we made some edits to it, um, got rid of the reference to Portland, for example, added the word dynamic to modify downtown. There were a couple other edits as well. We can go back and forth if you want to see exactly what changed. But I suppose I would put it to you all. What do you think of this vision statement? What might you take issue with, if anything? Definitely better than the first one. Well, and I was taking issue of having the word Portland in our, our, our yeah, statement. So I like the last one of metropolitan area. Yeah. For me, I just like I knew you touched that. Uh, but yeah, the talented residents. I don't know about that word. Yeah, I, I, I could see a change. That's the only thing that stood out to me was talented residents. You don't have professional, you know. Professional. Not everyone's talented. <laughs> yeah, well, not everyone's <laughs> professional either. <laughs> I don't know. That, that's the only thing that struck out at me. Yeah. Uh, high quality job is dealing to local residents. Yeah, local residents. And what's quality jobs? Right. It's different from one person to the next. Right. Well, and part of an economic development strategy typically is keep in mind, right? The the vision is where you want to go, what you want to be or what you want to be true in 10 years or 20 years. So it's aspirational. And I totally understand the pushback on talent, but I do think as part of an economic development strategy, we would typically address issues of workforce development. So where there are shortages in the workforce, in the talent base, those might be things we try to address through this plan, kind of bridging talent gaps wherever they might exist. Yeah, and if you're using this to help attract a, you know, a business to come to your area, I think, you know, yeah. talent would be something of the nature of a trade school would be really beneficial, I think, out here. Mm -hmm. That partnering with uh, you know, community college or something. Well, back when I was in high school, they did have classes out here, and shop classrooms and stuff. The community well, the college, did. yeah, and, and you know, the city isn't part of the high school, you know, the school system, but you know, in that same vein, you know, they're part of education. So the partnership that they could have with uh, maybe to do the same thing. Middle school and grade school. There's there's those type of things, but even with them, just you know, after school hours, you know, like we've done before. But you're right, you know, building up those trades in our area. I think the talented part of it, I, I see what you're saying, Hans. Um, but uh, it's I also think you know, it's just something that's right. I also think if you're using this to kind of go after the business, that, you know, like we do have talented, you know, right. like. Just our workforce here, it's like, well, you know, yeah, it's another that. adjective. <laughs> yeah. I, I get I would be better. Yeah. So, anyways, I don't know. I, I like the third one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. New talent. <laughs> well, well, the talent that you know. Yeah, we'll double in population in 20 years. So, at least there will be talent. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> there'll be some. What was said earlier? Knowledge, you know. Doubles every five years. So yeah, we're we're golden. Yeah. We're, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So sounds kind of like everybody's I uh, pretty good with all this. I think that was pretty good. Okay. Definitely like the third one better than the first two. First two. Well, you're moving in the right direction, Elliot. All right. We can keep workshopping it, but I'm glad it it's not um, you know, it's not a a complete red light and we don't have to start from scratch. We're we're close anyway, it sounds like. Yeah, I like the Portland gone, and you've narrowed outdoor Oregon to the gems of Mount Hood. <laughs> yeah, because it does. It, it, yeah, I mean, that's what it is. It qualifies who we are. Yeah. Don't be around the bush, it's Mount Hood. <laughs> yeah. Cool. All right. So then we've got a number of goals here. Um, I'm not going to read everything, but I'll just read the bolded text. Goal one improve systems to ensure broad and durable access to economic opportunity and maintain Sandy's high quality of life. So 
High quality of life is an important component to this. That's the character of Sandy. But this is also where some of those workforce issues come in. It's where some of the child care, the social assistance, the health care comes in. It's about making sure that everybody can participate well in Sandy's economy and access the things that make Sandy great. Goal two, leverage our investments in technology to maximize economic benefits. So SandyNet is the obvious one here, although I think that this leaves open um, the idea of future investments and in other complementary technologies. But we want to make sure that since you've got SandyNet as an asset and since it is unique, especially among communities of your size and communities within the metro, uh, that we are finding ways to make it impactful for you. So we talked last time we met about the development of like a co-working space and there wasn't much traction with that. So I don't think that's the direction that we would go here, but we don't want to turn our backs on Sandy Net either. So maybe the way we go with this in terms of actual strategies and actions is just about uh, better publicizing Sandy Net, making sure that every household in Sandy is getting the opportunity to use it maybe expanding geographic access if and where that makes sense, or maybe it's um, programs that are related to workforce development that are uniquely available because you have SandyNet or that build off some of those assets. I, you know, I'm not exactly sure the direction will go, but we thought this was a big enough asset that we wanted to make sure we were speaking to it in the strategy. I suppose one I didn't mention right there was um, home-based businesses and um, remote workers is another, you know, if we've got reliable gig speed uh, wireless to homes, does that enable more people who would have otherwise been commuting five days a week to stay home and work in Sandy three days a week? And that keeps some dollars in town. That's a, a fiscal benefit to the city as well. So just multiple avenues we can go with goal two. On a... Uh people working from home, how has that changed post-COVID? Because I'm sure a lot of big businesses are saying start coming back to the office or else, and you know, a lot of people working from home were resistant to that. You know, again, it's just like in my business, it radically changes from pre-COVID to post-COVID. I, I see that as one of those things that could be, you know, changing. Maybe you go a totally different direction. So how you know where's it going and how we adjust as it goes? It's a good question. I don't have a great answer. There is data about who continues to work from home or how frequently they work from home. Unfortunately, the limitation on that data is it's only available at the county level. So we can tell you week to week how that number changes across Clackamas County. I say week to week, it is just an estimate, but it's a product that the Census Bureau put together at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, they distribute surveys. They use the sample size from that survey to extrapolate, you know, an estimate with a margin for error. So that's useful data to help answer that question. It just doesn't provide something specific to Sandy necessarily. But good question, and and it remains to be seen how durable that trend will be. I can tell you that in my world in technology and working for Clackman CST, which is education, but we don't have students the same way other schools. We support people out there that uh, we've had to write a whole work from home policy because we, one, can't hire people because uh, without it saying right on the job description that you can work remotely from home, people just aren't applying. The first thing when they interview is, you know, can I work from home? You know, like that's the end of the conversation. And it's just not, here in Clackamas, it's all over my industry. When we talk, I get together with all the CIOs from around the uh, around the state of Oregon, having the same problem. They can't hire people. And there's a big difference between those agencies that have created a policy and have the policy of, no, you must be in the office. Um, and so we've also seen in that same cycle, working with the state, um, like in Portland and other places, they're just not coming back to the big buildings because, uh, York, and Portland, San Francisco, to Seattle, they've realized they can save a lot of money and people are not wanting to go home. I have a hard time with my own employees. Like, if you make me come back in the office, I quit because I can go get another job, look at them, mm -hmm. right? Like, I just quit. I am not going to be driving. And then when people were coming back in, they're like, are you going to pay my, my mileage? 
is it's too expensive to drive the gas to it. And then we didn't pay it before to come to the office. <laughs> We're not going to pay it now to the office. Yeah. Like, hey, why I, can't I work from home? I, 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 I the same thing. All the people, when they said you bus work from home, everybody re resisted and didn't want to. Yeah. So now yeah. they don't want to come back to exactly. work. And PCC, yeah. Portland Community College, is actually president's put out that for community college, we're face to face based. You're coming back to work. If you don't like it, sorry. And I've actually had people there in Tech yeah. that are trying to hire my employees that they've created a work from home policy for those. They've always had them. And the teachers, I think see, the guy said, the teachers are going, I can teach from my house. And no, so that there's this, yeah. no, exactly. Yeah. And so there's this, there, there is this yeah. the culture that changes. But, but, you, but well, you can't. Yeah, no, I agree. You can't, but you can't. Real, that's, that's, that's community college level. I've had, I've had people in a spin class uh, basically in a uh, Zoom meeting on their phone and their headphones on. <laughs> mm -hmm. Lastly, you know, they just have to show their present. And I've got, you know, I've got a couple of people that work for me that are they're bringing their grandkids and watching them. And I see the other day, three hours of zero productivity. And well, I can work from home. Well, no. what's that gonna look like? Five hours of no productivity. Yeah. So I think yeah, I think post COVID, and it'll take another year or two, they'll start getting data on productivity on all this. And unless you can put productivity based work at home, like sales, or your sales up and so forth. I think that I think that's going to shrink, yeah. but yeah. but you know as far as the uh, internet and having that speed, that's huge for businesses that have that base where you can. Yeah, edit. our requirements are you have to have the internet. You know, you pay yourself, and you have to have these good speeds. There was a San Diego customer, a friend of mine, who uh, was so delighted to have the gig fiber up and down because his place in Portland said you can work from home only if you had. I forget what the speeds right. were like, you know, 300 megs, you know, uh, uh, down or up or whatever, because thinking no one would have it. This is before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And he's like, oh, not a problem. I have that here. Yeah. <laughs> so he only had to go down once a week or whatever. I well, think why I got to come here because my Zoom doesn't work at all. I think yeah, overall, what you're going to find is the people that can perform at home will be able to. Well, but yeah, like they say, the statistics will start coming out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just not everybody's geared to work from home. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, it, it's just like what happened with COVID. And, you know, some of the pitfalls and everything with the sure. lockdowns. I mean, it's gonna, the next two years, it's gonna, the information and the data is all going to come out, and then everything's going to be adjusted from there. Mm -hmm. right? It'll figure itself out. It just won't look the same as it did. Yeah, before. but that's why I'm saying, if this, you know workforce, home workforce, put an emphasis on that when it can maybe just flip. Uh, if people that can commute to Portland two or three days a week to be in the office building, but they can do two days at home, you know, now you got that transportation issue, you know, being out in the traffic. Well, yeah, $5 dollars infrastructure. $5 dollar down gas is pushing this a little more. Yeah. Come on, it's 395 down the street. Yeah, well, I know it's <laughs> <so much laughs> <of that. laughs> We don't be dancing. We're going to use those Safeway uh, box and Fred Myers. Yeah, my 60 cents off a gallon yeah. of Fred Myers. Great. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Keep it moving here. Yeah, yeah, let's, jackpot. <laughs> let's, let's keep it moving on to goal three. Goal three, build on our businesses and workers in manufacturing to establish Sandy as a destination for metals fabrication and related activities. And to peel back the hood on this one, we've mentioned, I, I think we've foreshadowed quite a bit that this could be a goal. It was identified in the strengths. It was identified on a regional basis in the opportunities. And I mentioned then that there are some potential synergies there. Got companies like um, Leatherman and Precision that are in that metals fabrication space and exist in the region and also are geared towards outdoor recreation. And so with Sandy being already naturally located to take advantage of recreation assets and having some existing workforce, some existing businesses in the metals fabrication space, there's a niche there in recreation-oriented metals fabrication that I think you could grow. And then there are other 
of course, apparel industry companies like you mentioned before, Nike and Columbia and others um, that are are based in the metro. And I think that too potentially is an opportunity. But really, goal three is about metals fabrication within your larger sort of manufacturing base. Dude, I, I think I missed something somewhere along the line here. How do we settle on metals fabrication? Period. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I was thinking the same thing. Like, I mean, we do have a fair number of companies that work in metals fabrication. They're like, yes, that works. Here's Andy. Okay. Uh, again, like okay. Elliot said, it's a small collection because we're a small okay. town. But yeah, there's a number of them. And um, as I said earlier, I mentioned earlier, Clock this is something Clock is really pushed for a while because we're not the only. City in Clackamas County that has these small manufacturing. I mean, SKF is a lot of work down there. So it's can Yeah, so it's more Clackamas. So um, that's, I, I mean, it's, I mean, it's, it's, just it's needs, here already. It's been like, here for a while. It's just a lot But of it's like we also have the plastic injection molding in town. We have, I mean, there's. Well, I mean, I can tell you now I have at least uh, six fabrication shops as customers of mine. And a lot of them are actually kind of outside of city limits and they're um, some of them are fairly large um not cascade precision but there's no one called cpi that's out off 352nd that's a customer there's uh, i know at least a couple out on marmot road the industrial off of ruben lane um i believe has one or two of them there's three on industrial lane across from us metalworks trillion machine and then two other fabrication plants yeah, so it's, just it's hidden, not something that you would know. It's a hidden thing here. Yeah, well, it's okay. Just so they don't advertise. So what does Sandy have for industrial? Well, that's the and, yeah, that's been the problem up until right. now. Is uh, it's not a lack of business interest; it's a lack of available land. There's just not a lot of industrial um, land open for or uh, lots that are up for development. And as we expand the boundary and take up some farmland. Um, yeah, or our terrain has not been degraded either. Yeah, yeah Camby has a lot of flat land, right? So we have a lot of Estacada. hill. <laughs> yeah, that's the, that's been the difference. Estacada has this like 20 or 30 acre area down there where that they've cut into like these little five acre parcels, and that's why they and they're getting business interest, but, but it's all flat and they've already kind of put in the roads and some of the that okay. infrastructure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Tons. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. I mean, that's something we just need to identify, and that's something the EOA is working on, right? The uh, economic opportunities analysis that Eco Northwest is working on for us right now is to identify the fact that yes, in fact, we do have a deficit of industrially zoned land uh, open for development, and um, we need to figure out how to correct that somehow. Um, it could just mean rezoning, you know, identifying a certain section of town. Oh, yeah, that would work great for another. In uh, industrial section, it's only really appropriately, uh, or it could be probably more out north, north or down north. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, that, we haven't done that part yet, but um, but that's been the problem up until now for some reason. What happened to the guy that was going to develop by the movie theater over there? It's in the works, road yeah. fabrication. Yeah. Oh, yeah, road fabrication. I haven't talked to him in quite a while. I don't know. He, was, he seemed he, pretty gung ho about it. Yeah, he was pretty gung ho. He had a, a, a site plan uh, and plans yeah. set up and everything. And then everything was yeah. approved, um, as far as I know, through the pre application process. And he was pretty much ready to go. Um, last I spoke with him was about a year ago. And he mentioned that it was going to at least be a year, if not probably close to two years, before we started development. Okay. I think so, he, as far as I know, he's still anticipating on doing it, but he, I think he anticipated it being a bit easier for him on that, and yeah. he got it taken care of much sooner, but I believe he owns the land. No, he does. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and um, my understanding is, I haven't talked to him much, but he's had a couple of roadmaps to do with this, all the owners do, as you well know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the plan is, I, I mean, he hasn't said that he's not interested at all. I just hadn't seen anything happen for like a Thank you for reminding me about that. I haven't thought I haven't thought about that for a while, but I do need to reach back out to him and see to make sure that he's okay. The lot across from there, did Clackamas County ever release that? Because that's where their health clinic was going to go. Right. And it's still in my Clackamas County. I don't know what they're talking So so that's why. Okay. Yeah. That's no, they, they've been, been here general, all along. It's just general 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 you don't realize. Okay. okay. Yeah. I will say it did actually come through pretty clearly in the data that was collected and presented in the economic opportunities analysis. They did an analysis um, of what they call location quotients, which is basically how specialized Sandy is in any given sector relative to the larger regional economy. 
So it's like, you know, how many jobs as a percentage or as a fraction of a, a larger total does Sandy have in metals fabrication versus the region's percent of the total? And Sandy is far more specialized in metals fabrication than most other communities, far more specialized than the broader region. So there's a a concentration there, and it might not be a ton of jobs now, might be 50 or 100, but as a percentage of Sandy's total employment, that's pretty significant. So you've got a workforce or a talent advantage there. You have companies that can share expertise, share knowledge, share learnings um, that might have established supply chains, things like that. And now it's just about, can you bring in some of the bigger players regionally to scale this up? So that's the idea. And another advantage to metals fabrication is that um, it does tend to produce medium wage jobs um, and does require college education so much. So things that you, know, you can make a, a, a living wage at after working it for a couple of years um, without having college education, that's a big deal. Goal four, cultivate emerging innovators in our specialty food and beverage industries and align business development activities with the robust food storage and processing sector of the region. So this is not something that there's a ton of in Sandy now. There are a few businesses that would be considered assets in this space. Um, some of them are just outside city limits, but nonetheless have a Sandy presence. More so, this is about an opportunity regionally. You look at what's being produced in the region. Can Sandy be trading on that in some way to provide storage, processing, refrigeration? Um, can you leverage your recycled water in some way in this space so that you are generating some economic activity based on what's going on outside of city limits? Goal five, invest in hospitality and place-based tourism to make Sandy the most active and vibrant base camp for Mount Hood area adventures. I think this one's fairly self-explanatory. Um, you all know your assets in this space better than I do, uh, although I've had the pleasure of taking advantage of a number of them over the years, just in visiting. I think what my experience has been, and this has been borne out by conversations we've had with others, you're actually pretty limited in lodging opportunities and the lodging that does exist. You know, there are pros and cons. I've stayed up in Gubby before. I've been rained on while skiing up at um, Ski Bowl before, uh, but it, there's not a lot going on there. There's not a lot being offered at night for food and beverage. Um, so while some people will inevitably trade, um, you know, the lack of dining options for proximity to the mountain, there'll be others that might be looking to, um, you know, stay in a place where they do have access to a craft brewery, for example, and it's not just the Rathskeller. Um, so I think, you know, to do that, that would involve a conscious choice on Sandy's part. And there would be some things, some investments that would need to be made. There would be businesses that might need to be recruited. Um, lodging is limited in Sandy right now. There's, I think, pretty much just the best Western. Um, yep. Which is a fine hotel, but it only fits one niche or one segment of traveler, really. And so you might look to diversify that and recruit new lodging options to town. You might continue to encourage small businesses in the food and beverage space in downtown Sandy so that you're um, expanding those offerings and just making Sandy that destination that is close enough to the mountain, but provides way more in terms of um, arts, entertainment, local recreation, uh, food and beverage, hospitality, as compared to what's available up the highway. Is there any demand for any convention business, like on a smaller level? I know you'd probably have to have another hotel with that, but is there any, because I mean, right now, if you have a large gathering, there's not really very many places in Sandy you can get a large gathering together. That's well, good we, we, can have, we can hold 600 people in our gym. We've got tables right. set up for 150. I mean, we used to have church service there. Okay. Uh, on this way, you've got what the end of the mountain. We used to have the Oregon Optometric Association meeting there all the time. Yeah. The re, yeah, the resort. The resort. resort. Yeah. yeah. Okay. They they have a they have a whole area. But I think you're talking in between there is even because I I was thinking the same thing. We go to the robotics tournament. We go to you know these other things, and we're going to go and stay in hotels. To be there in that community, right. and Sandy doesn't really have a yeah, kind of that yeah. same 
where you can have it right in the yeah, you know, we had a few years ago a uh, hotel looking at a property. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and that's right. They, the uh, local person that was looking at it liked mm -hmm. everything, but on the regional level, just the demographics and everything was in no. So I, I, I think if the downtown was more robust because a lot of things are walkable and you could do something, mm -hmm. you know, on the north side. Mm -hmm. and, well, I, I have talked to actually two hoteliers um, since I've been here. One was her, um, the lady from uh, Cannon Beach. And um, another, oh God, I can't remember the name of it. It, it was a uh, hotel company that all, that all heard of, but their names escaping me at the moment. Um, they both wanted to talk about um, having some sort of event at, uh, or um, you know, some, some sort of space for that sort of thing. Um, and, and that was a big deal. And particularly for the corporate one, the second one, they they really felt that having a restaurant, and I don't know that I necessarily agree so much with that, they wanted to have a high-end restaurant, they wanted to have some sort of space they could use for smaller conventions, because they said that was important for their business. So um, it just, just a point, of, just a data point, that that was something that both hoteliers talked about. So Elliot, was there any looking in, into that? Did that come up at all? It hasn't yet, but we can look into it. The door's not closed on that. Um, I will say it's it's been a tricky time just with the pandemic, right? The convention spaces have had a rough go of it these last three years or so. Uh, but I do think all of those in-person activities are coming back and they might be looking for that type of space. And it sounds like anecdotally, David's had people asking for it. So that's something we can look into. Yeah, I don't know I'm talking, you don't think you're no, a big no. image, a bit smaller. Because even when the city of Sandy tries to do just their uh, goal setting, that's outside this room, we have a hard time finding a spot. Yeah, right. No, that's, so that's true. Are you asking more for something like the size like a civic center? That would be where you could have a larger meeting, but then also move like your council chambers and have it available for people to rent it out. I mean, that's something that a lot of cities do, and it's not quite yeah, the size of a conference. Yeah, no, I was thinking more of just kind of be part of the hotel too. Yeah. You know? oh. Yeah. Yeah. I thought that's what we need Yeah. And even when I first got on with Scott Lazenby here, there was some of the very interested. Yeah. That was here, the Cannon Beach lady. The Cannon Beach lady up here. And it just didn't work out timing wise with her, but she had her own hotel down in Cannon Beach. And then, what about the opposite of that if it's not a hotel? There's a lot of other options than just a hotel. Oh, yeah. Hotel. yeah. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I I have a dream of getting hold of Sabella's farm and turning it into a tiny house hotel house. with an RV park in the back of it. I yeah. got I well, geeked out about that with a, a guy I knew, and he he moved away. It wasn't wasn't interested in dealing with that chunk of land. You know, it's funny you bring up RV park because you'd be surprised how many times I've heard that mm -hmm. too. Um, and Elliot, had, did you ever run into that? Talk about an RV park or you know, particularly what I hear about is a place for people in RVs that have like horses and stuff to stop and take their horses out for a walk and stuff like that. Like, boy, that's really specific. But that's kind of happening down from Mount Hitsa. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And a whole bunch of RV oh, really? parking. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I don't know if any of it's legal. Well, that actually came up when the high school was being built. Yeah. 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 The high school was being built there. And I was, we met back when we used to meet with the, the board there and our board. And asking like, what is it that we could, you know, what what is it that we you think we need? Mm -hmm. and, and someone brought the fact that RV park mm -hmm. because if they do baseball tournaments or softball tournaments, they're there for the weekend, right? And people bring their or trailer. Right. I have a guy that works for me that he travels all over the state. His daughter is on a competition softball thing. He takes his trailer all over a couple of different states uh, on the weekends. Good but, example of it would be like the vintage. Yeah. Uh, the other, I forget exactly where they're sitting now. I've been by it a million times. But the vintage, it's vintage plaza. No, the vintage is like a gigantic RV park, but the whole big section of it is like retro um, RVs and stuff that they oh, like airstream kind of, stuff, kind of like tiny houses. Oh, okay. It is cool. But there's a large, there's a large segment of people that you know they would rent a tiny house for sure. Probably wouldn't stay in a hotel. 
Yeah. Or if you had a combination of tiny house and RVs yeah. and yeah. you had the shuttle up to the mountain, mm -hmm. you can't take your RV up there. Right, right. That well, would be the draw. Yeah. And, yeah. And then had that where that was a pickup area. But uh, I went to college up in Bellingham uh, and the county up there, uh, their gross leading income for the county is softball. The oh, huge oh. tournaments that people came from a lot. Mostly from Canada, I think, yeah. I think of DC, but it was huge. We mm -hmm. had where they had eight fields on one side of the road, eight on the other. Wow. It just packed it down. Yeah. So, I mean, you got, you got some sort of event that's kind of a yeah. affordable. Leadville, Colorado did the same kind of thing with bikes. The Leadville was mm -hmm. old mining town, and it just went downhill and everything. The community got together and reinvented themselves, and they're going strong. Yeah, I think to your point with the softball up in Bellingham, there, you know, I've always thought, you know, when I have kids and, you know, like soccer fields and things like that, you know, you, you go to these places and, you know, you have all these events and all weekend long, if you can. The one right across from Riverfresh, that was my dream, because you need flat property. Yeah, sure. yeah 360 second through. All those people, are, where are they going for lunch? I know we drop our kids, you know, you're there all day. You come and you, you shop the community. And it's weekend after weekend right. after so weekend. He's got that 20 day. acres. They could take five acres for an RV, put in some softball fields, half the, uh, going down the Sandy River, the, you know, dirt bike. Mm -hmm. All for it. Still, but anyway, yeah, I think uh, there's a sporting aspect of it that doesn't always include Mount Hood, but we're we're outside of we're we're you look at perfect the, destination. The complex in Happy Valley, that place is always full of soccer or whatever, and then you've got all of Happy Valley food right there. Well, my relatives, I grew up right down the street from the uh, Walt Hills Park and Rec um, District, um, there on 157th Water. And it wasn't always that big, obviously, but that pool's been there since the early 80s. I used to go swimming there, or since the 70s. I used to go swimming there all the time. The and uh, the it's been interesting to watch that space grow over the course of time. I mean, it is a full on sports yeah. complex. Now, there, there are some, we do um, uh, club volleyball, club bay yeah. teams. We've yeah. got well over 100 kids that are, and they pay a lot of money. They play in SIBA. SIBA had asked us, well, our courts for their power league. If there was a court system, you know, where you had about six volleyball courts, mm -hmm. basketball courts, yep. pickleball courts yep. that was all enclosed, that thing would be packed every weekend or something. Yeah. I think if all of you yeah. can do SIVA and we'll have that book from January probably through June with yeah. uh, tournaments. Yeah. Um, that alone, that's you're talking six months right there, and then in the fall, pickleball or off hours, pickleball just have you to be able to share pickleball there and make a fortune. My goodness. Well, yeah, there's a place that opened up, they charge over a hundred dollars a month. Oh. Um, and we, we've got three courts, and you kill everything with the club for 50 some. Yeah. All right, yeah. let's keep it Great all idea, here. <laughs> this is the last one. Um, be a leader as both retail hub and heart of East Clackamas County. And retail obviously has the downside in, in the sense that it doesn't always pay the highest wages. Uh, but what we'd be looking to encourage through this goal is not just bringing, say, big box retailers where the ownership is outside of town, but to focus on entrepreneurship and small business growth, small business formation. Part of bringing in those dollars from outside spenders, whether it's for a sports tournament or for people going down to the river or using the Sandy Ridge system or just coming because this is the nearest shopping center to their home outside of Sandy, in a state where you have no retail sales tax, of course, is that those dollars can support local businesses and business owners who are actually, um, you know, ensuring their own family's well-being um, as opposed to dollars that are actually being shipped outside the community even though they're spent inside the community. So I think this goal is about retail but with a, a local flavor is the intent. West Sandy, what area is that? Oh that's uh, Skipper Lundy, that's uh, 362nd Street. 
Okay. Just that one. Yeah, that, that specific area. That right area now. there, we're calling the west end okay. for right now, just for lack of a better term. Sure. That includes Sabella as well, that property or no? No, that's okay. considered it, on the other side of the highway sometimes. All right. So that's all I had. I'm happy to stay around for as long as you want for more discussion here. Uh, but that's kind of where we're at. And we don't have to take tonight as our only opportunity for feedback. You can pass any additional feedback that occurs to you through David to me. And we've got an opportunity here for the next couple of weeks to continue editing these. But I wanted to present them to you as sort of the next step in the development of the, the action plan or the strategic plan itself and give you an opportunity to weigh in. David, is that something you can send to us that we can? Sure. Thanks. If I missed someone. But... Yeah, as a matter of fact, Elliot, if you're okay with that, I'll just uh, send the slide deck out to everybody here. That's perfect. Okay. Done. Right. Uh, Sandy's growth per capita isn't it still like one of the top three? Not anymore. Not according to the last census. We're still growing, and we're still growing at a fairly good clip. But actually, no, the fastest growing. Only the bend. Yeah, no, right now the fastest growing city in the state, believe it or not. <laughs> oh, yeah, they grow a lot. Huh? Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, they, they're so at what at what rates? Because it's always like 10,000 yeah, no, or more. Or, yeah, uh, yeah, no, I'd have to go back and look, but it has, we've slowed. We've, we've slowed down. Right? Well, there's also a more more And then, yes, yeah, there's so, also that. But um, that's, that's only been in place in one. Yeah, it hasn't really. Because there's still there's still several minutes that are they, they can still out. yeah so there's a moratorium but it, you know if all goes well uh, knock on wood you know it shouldn't affect that uh, yeah well I mean there'll be effect but it'll be effect a couple years down the road because it's, it's you know one percent we don't be able to see it you know because it's just not uh, there's not going to be a lot of permits going out over the next six months, but then once the more time is left, we will. Well, we we can send out like 120 permits. Yeah, and in and that time frame, we don't normally see that many anyways. Mm -hmm. So, so there's a possibility it may not affect us all that much. So, is there is there an update on building a new sewer plant, right? In addition, oh yeah, there's is all kinds of information on the website. Yeah, about that. I mean, are they breaking down on that soon or? Oh no, no, no. Jeremy does know about that. Yeah. He's, there's a lot of red tape, right? Yeah, with the EPA federal. and federal. They're that, building it down off Sunset down off there, right? That was one of the plans that we had was to build a okay. uh, satellite one there, right? Pump up and go yeah. and send the water to Roslyn Lake, um, you know, the yeah. wetlands area. Uh, but there's always more discovery and things like this that are happening on. But in the process, even from day one, it was going to take, you know, eight years, six, eight years. I mean, just for permitting process. Isn't that what's limiting the growth though? It's the sewer capacity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we're we're working on it. No, I but uh, it's not. it's no, I know it's just the frustration part is is mm -hmm. you guys spend tens of million dollars to do studies to do what they want, you know. It's yeah. like that means you hammer you down, down and, and no, you can't get up. We're gonna hammer you more, and, but you're. But now you gotta provide the. I'm down my soapbox. Yeah. You gotta provide the housing. Sure. No, you can't do it. So no, you can't provide it. Well, and then you can think about it. You've got uh, right now. You got rising to yeah. interest Easy. rates. <laughs> you got pretty high property taxes because of a school and the sewer and water. Mm -hmm. I mean, my bills quadrupled. It's almost five grand a month. So we are not the only city. We're just no. one of the very first ones that's happening. I, I'm waiting for SK to drop the, that shoe because that is a tiny little, it's, it's the fastest growing one. And we already know that they have issues with theirs too. Yeah, that's good. But every one of these cities have the same issue because all the sewer treatment plants were all built around the same time no. using the same money no. from the feds. The feds gave them all the money 50 years ago. And so to build all these things, well, guess what? Right? All of them are going down, but now it's like you know, a multi-billion dollar infrastructure build up perhaps. Well, and that's but that's <laughs> yeah, but that's yeah, exactly some, that's some of the stuff we've requested and help you know get this, but you know, everyone yeah. wants their that's hand in the government job. camp. Well, they start building things that they don't build need to get there. Two cents. For 
full build out of any land up there. It's monstrous that sewer plant up there. It's, they'll never have to build another one. Well, not never, but where's that? Government camp. Oh, really? We did Ur urban renewal district, and first thing they did was build a new sewer plant with the capacity in the room for complete build out of all the land in government camp, because there's only a certain amount, mm -hmm. plus any potential land trip. So that Meadows land trip, it's all factored in and they can just expand the plant a little bit and it's all designed to the yeah. full build out. Well, we're starting to drift into uh, discussions to have over malted beverage. Sorry. Uh, yeah. area. No, that's fine. Um, but uh, I just wanted to uh, thank Elliot for his time tonight and for the update and to give you the opportunity to go uh, and do your thing as you would like to. All right. So thank you again. And uh, no need to sit and listen to us <laughs> anymore. Thanks for having me. Enjoy the beverage, everyone. And I will see you again in January. Sounds great. And uh, we don't have that uh, meeting scheduled yet. As soon as we do, I will. Yeah. Sounds good. Thanks, all. Right. all. Thanks, Alex. Thanks. All right. Well, there's no other discussion.